This right here is the Flywoo Fly Lens 85, and I am working on a review of it. And in order to review it, I have to fly it. And in order to fly it, I have to set it up. I have to bind it to my controller and do all the things that you have to do if you just bought one and you need to get it into the air. So if you did just buy one and you need to get it into the air, come along with me. Let's do it together. I'm Joshua Bardwell. You're going to learn something today. And the first thing I need to do is find the gosh dang USB port on this thing. But here is a USB port. That's the USB port for the O3 air unit from DJI. That's the video transmitter. And if I had recorded some video, that's how I would offload the video. But that is not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the USB port on the flight controller. There it is. And it's a USB micro. That's a shame, but okay. We like USB-C, don't we? With USB plugged in, the next thing to do is start up Betaflight Configurator. Uh, Betaflight is the firmware that's running on this flight controller. If you don't have Betaflight Configurator downloaded and installed, or if you've never used it before, I'm gonna refer you to a tutorial I did for absolute beginners to get you started from zero. We're gonna be starting from like, you know, th three out of 10. So here is Betaflight Configurator. We'll plug in and connect. Now this flight controller has come with Betaflight 442 on it, and uh, that is not the absolute latest version of Betaflight. The latest ver version of Betaflight is 4.5, and many people will be tempted at this point to just flash Betaflight 4.5 you want to be on the latest and greatest. Isn't the first thing that you should do when you get a new piece of equipment to be on the latest firmware? No, not if it's a, a, a quadcopter. Bind and fly quadcopters come from the manufacturer pre-configured, ready to go. And if you flash to the latest version of Betaflight, it completely wipes out the configuration. Just leave it. Unless you know how to set up a quadcopter 100% from scratch, and know how to migrate all the settings from 4.4.2 to 4.5, just leave it. Just fly it on 4.4.2. You don't need to be on the latest. I can't tell you how many people wipe out their configuration, wipe out their quadcopter, and then they just spent money on something that doesn't work anymore. Don't do it. And the first thing I want to do, let's just look in the receiver tab because I need to bind my receiver to my controller. The controller I'm going to be using in this video is the RadioMaster Boxer. Uh, the receiver that is in this quadcopter is an Express LRS receiver, and the Boxer has an Express LRS radio in it. You can use any Express LRS radio, whether it's the Boxer, the RadioMaster TX16S, the RadioMaster Pocket, or really any radio with an internal or an external Express LRS module, as long as it matches the Express LRS frequency that came with your quadcopter. Uh, and just looking at the product page here, I see that the fly lens only comes with 2.4 gigahertz Express LRS. So if you somehow have a 900 megahertz Express module, that's not going to work. And if you've bought it with Crossfire, it will be a different binding video. I'll put a link in the video description below to my Crossfire getting started guide, and you can watch that. But I think most people are going to be using Express LRS. The next thing I'm going to do is look around this quadcopter for the LED that belongs to the receiver, because that LED is going to tell me what the receiver's doing. Is it bound? Is it binding? Is it bound? Etc. Etc. And typically on a flight controller, there are going to be three LEDs. One of them is going to be the power LED. That's this red one. Uh, one of them is going to be the status LED, and that is the this blue blinking one, and one of them is going to be the receiver LED, and that is going to be this fast flashing green one, and I just know that from experience. I also know from experience that that fast flashing means that the Express LRS receiver has gone into Wi-Fi mode. You can actually connect to an Express LRS receiver with your web browser over Wi-Fi to do various configurations to it, but we're going to try to skip that step. Hopefully we don't need to. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to put the receiver into binding mode. And there are various ways to put an Express LRS receiver into binding mode. If we had Betaflight 4.5, we actually could just click a bind button here in the receiver tab. Ooh, almost tempts me to upgrade to 4.5. Don't do it. It's not worth it. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to power down the receiver by unplugging USB. You can't see. I'm just reaching down here and doing it. But watch the LEDs here. I'm going to power it up. And as soon as I see that receiver blink one time, I'm going to power it down again. There we go. Did you see that blink? One blink. And do it again. One blink, and I'm unplugging it. Two blinks, three blinks. Now, the third time I plug it in, do you see that it has gone blink, 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 two blinks? That's binding. By power cycling this thing quickly, one, two, three times, we put it into binding mode. And if that sounds a little bit 
cumbersome. Well, would you rather be digging around in there with a poker looking for the bind button? Eh, there's various ways to go about it. Now that the receiver is in bind mode, we're gonna go into the ExpressLRS script on our radio. On the boxer, we're gonna do that by holding down the sys key. We're gonna highlight the ExpressLRS script and we're gonna click the jog wheel and that will start the ExpressLRS script and you should see this stuff load in. We're gonna scroll down to where it says bind and hit bind and when we do that, two things should happen. Number one, the LED on the receiver should turn solid indicating that we're bound. And number two, we should see a C in the upper right corner of the script Again, indicating that we're bound. Now that the receiver is bound, we're gonna come back into Betaflight. We're gonna to go to the receiver tab and we should see that when we move the sticks on our controller, the channels here move. And the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna check that the correct channel moves. So if I raise and lower the throttle, you see that the throttle channel is moving. If I move the yaw stick left and right, you see that the yaw channel is moving. Pitch forward and back, the pitch channel moves. Roll left and right, the roll channel moves. If yours doesn't work out like that, if like you move the throttle, but instead of the throttle moving, the roll channel moves, you need to fix your channel map. We're not gonna go into that in this video. There's another video I made in my absolute beginners tutorial, and I'm gonna link you to that in the video description below. If we're lucky, your channel map will match the channel map on the quadcopter and everything will work out correctly. The other thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna check my endpoints when I move this stick all the way to the left, we should see a value of 1,000. And when I move the stick all the way to the right, we should see a value of 2,000. And that should be true for the throttle and for the pitch and the roll channel, 1,000 to 2,000. Now, if your numbers are pretty close to 1,000 and 2,000, like, you know, 1,900 and 2,011 and 1,990, if they're pretty close, like plus or minus 10, you don't need to worry too much, but if they're off by more than about five or 10, you want to adjust your endpoints. And again, there'll be a video linked in the video description below for how to do that. But most people aren't going to have to do it, so we're just going to leave it alone. Now that the receiver is bound, the next thing to do is to set up the aux modes. And aux modes are how the flight controller knows that like when I flip this switch, it means I want the quadcopter to arm. Here's how we set up the aux modes. By the way, the it has come with some default aux modes. I don't know what controller configuration those are intended to match up to, so they're probably useless, okay? So just leave the, we're gonna have to replace these aux modes with however your controller is set up. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I want the arm mode, so I'm gonna take aux two right here and I'm gonna change it to auto and I'm gonna flip this switch. And when I do, it'll fill in aux one, okay? It has picked up the fact that this switch is moving channel aux one. Okay, then what I need to do is I need to tell it which of these switch positions means that the quadcopter should be armed. And I'm gonna do that by flipping the switch into the arm position. I like my arm position to be away and my disarm position to be towards. That's actually backwards from how a lot of people like to do it, but that's how I learned it and that's how I do it. So armed is gonna be here. You put your switch in your armed position, whatever you decide you want it to be. And then I'm gonna drag this over and when this little yellow tick mark, do you see that this little yellow tick mark indicates the switch position? When that tick mark is in the range of this yellow right here, that means that the quadcopter will arm. And I'm gonna go ahead and save that. Horizon mode, I hate it. I'm gonna delete it. I don't want it. Click the X right here to delete it. Let's see, I'm gonna disable hide unused modes so I can see all the modes. I do like to have angle mode as an option. So I'm gonna hit add range for angle mode. I'm gonna move that switch into position, and I like that to be the middle position on this right-hand three-position switch, which is what it is. I'll save that. And then for flip crash, I like that to be the down position on this three-position switch, and that's great. So angle, flip crash. And then the last one we've got is this user one mode, and I don't know what this is for. A lot of times the, the user one mode is, is configurable by the user, where the user is usually the manufacturer of the flight controller, not necessarily you, the user of the quadcopter. But the user one mode is usually used to flip the video transmitter power on and off. So I'm gonna guess that this is designed to turn the video transmitter power on and off, but I don't wanna delete this and I don't wanna screw it up. I have to figure out what it does. And the first thing I'm gonna do is like, I'm just gonna look at the product page for the fly lens. 
I don't know if they have a manual or something that tells me what it does, okay? There is a manual, drone manual. Flylens drone resources, okay, great. Operational guide, LED, okay, okay. So the user one mode turns the LEDs on and off, I see. So do we want the LEDs on or off? Let's grab a battery and let's play with this. Okay, they're off right now. Let's say I make this user one mode be disabled. Now they turn on. Well, I don't know. I, I, I don't think I wanna like flip a switch to make them go on and off. I mean, I'd, I'd like them either to be on or off. If I wanted to flip a switch, I could assign some switch. I guess I could, I could assign this switch here. It's not doing anything. Let's try it. Auto, aux four. Okay, so we'll save that. And now when I flip that switch, they'll turn on and off. Now, what do I want the default to be? So most of my switches, I push away as their default position before I power on the controller. And that's the way I know everything powers up in the sort of default state. I think I would like the LEDs to be on. On by default, because LEDs are cool and I'll turn them off when I want them to be off. Like for example, if they're throwing a color cast and screwing up my video. If I wanted to change that, I would just drag this down here. And now I've changed which switch position has them on versus off, but I think I'm gonna do that. Great, we are set up. There are a couple other changes I like to make on almost all the quadcopters I fly. And one of them is to go into the configuration tab and change this maximum arm angle. The idea behind the max arm angle is if the quadcopter is tilted past a certain angle, it won't arm. And that's intended as a safety precaution to keep you from accidentally arming the quadcopter like while you're carrying it in your hands after you've finished a flight. Well, there's two things about that. Number one, this little guy isn't going to hurt very much if you do accidentally arm it. And number two, it's a pain in the butt to like set the quadcopter down and it's kind of like on a rock or a hill and it refuses to arm. So I always disable this by changing the max arm angle to 180 degrees. The other thing I like to do is this doesn't have any beepers on it. Like, so if it crashes in the grass, it can be very hard to find. I like to enable the motor beeper, which you know how you plug in and it goes do 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 do. That's the motors that are making that sound. They can just kind of be coerced into making sounds. And if I turn on these two options, we'll also have the motor beeper. However, in order to take advantage of that motor beeper, I am gonna have to go back to the modes tab and add a beeper mode, add range. And I like that to be this switch here, aux three fills in, and that's the switch position where it's pressed and released. And now I'll need to plug in a battery for this to actually work. But if I do that, it's not very loud, oh well. Better than nothing, I guess. The next thing I wanna do is set up the on-screen display. This on-screen display gives you information about the quadcopter while you're flying. Things like your signal strength. Are you about to fail safe because you've flown too far away and your radio can't keep up? Are you about to run your battery dead? Battery voltage and other important information. I am disappointed that this ships with what looks like an analog OSD. What I think Fly will have done here is they've got the same Betaflight configuration for all of their video transmitters and they're shipping the OSD configured for the lowest common denominator. The, uh, the DJI O3 air unit and the other digital air units can actually have a much higher resolution on-screen display that's so much nicer than what you're seeing here. Let's, let's improve this. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to go and we're going to change the video format from auto to HD. And when we do that, look what happens. Do you see how much different this OSD is? Now, instead of having just this little a square here, which is a low resolution standard definition display, we have this great big display and we can drag these things all around in our goggles and set them up any way we want. And amazingly, they have also correctly set the canvas width and height for the DJI O3 air unit. I don't that can't be an accident, but I almost never see people do this correctly. And I'm super impressed with Flywoo that they have. In order to set up the Air Units OSD, you can click to enable or disable individual elements and then drag those elements around on screen. You can even have your goggles on your face while you're doing this and you'll see these changes reflected. But what I like to do is I have a paste bin where I have saved my OSD configurations. And here is my O3 OSD configuration. And I'm just going to copy that and then go to the CLI 
and paste that in and type the word save. And when I come back, voila, here we go. That's my standard DJI O3 configuration for my OSD. And I'll put a link to that paste bin in the video description if you want to do the same. Well, at this point, the quadcopter is pretty much set up. The only thing left to do is to bind our goggles and then we should be ready to fly. In order to bind the O3 air unit to the goggles too, we're going to press the bind button on the goggles too, which is right here. The goggles too will begin beeping and then we're going to need to power this up and find the bind button on the O3. And on the O3, the bind button is right here. I can actually reach it with my finger because it's a naked O3. No, I can't. It's right here. There, blinking solid green. And sure enough, we have video. There's only one thing else that you're going to need to do, and that is go into the menu, go down to settings, go to display, and change your canvas mode from normal to HD. Until you do that, that beautiful high definition OSD that we made won't display correctly. And with that, we've got a fully configured quadcopter that we're ready to take outside and fly. But that's not the end. It's the end of this video, but it's not the end of you learning about configuring and setting up and building quadcopters. If you're interested in building your own quadcopter from scratch, which is really the only way to really learn how to maintain them and how to get the most out of them. Or if you're interested in learning more about the in-depth of the configuration, like I just walked you through a couple of perfunctory steps, but there's a lot more to setting up Betaflight that you could know. The single best way for you to do that is to get my beginner build kit. My beginner build kit is designed to take you from zero all the way to having a built quadcopter that you built and configured from scratch by yourself and flying it. It's about four hours of video content, which is a lot, but it's the minimum amount of stuff that I thought you needed to know to actually understand what you're doing and not just kind of be led through the process by the nose without really knowing why. There's a link in the video description to my video series about that, and I invite you to check it out. Also, if you're interested in, if you somehow haven't picked this up and you're interested in picking it up, there's a link to where you can get it and my review. I'm reviewing this. I haven't even flown it yet. So maybe it sucks. I don't know. We're going to find out. There's a link to the review. All that stuff's in the video description or cards on screen. And I'll see you there. Voila.